first, uh, first of all, let's just make sure that next time we have a chair. We got three students are presenting next time. Who are they? Raise your hand. They're not here. <coughs> Uh, Jim Harper, Ramon, and here he is, and Liliana Hello, Hello. Okay. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Mike Willig from University of Connecticut. Um, I he. he uh, I, you know, I've read lots of articles by Mike over over time in terms of statistical analysis of uh, different of biodiversity. And uh, when I was um, when when I was uh, thinking about the uh, the theme of this of this symposium that we're having about disturbance, um, I happened to see his his article in. Is his chapter in the book from the Lucio that was produced by the Lucio LTER site? I was very impressed with it, and so um, I invited him to come, and he's been here for a couple days, and we'll get out the Everglades tomorrow, and um, um, so he is he he's um, director of the. Um, of the Center for Environmental Sciences and Engineering at University of Connecticut currently, and as, is a longtime collaborator at Lucio National Forest in Puerto Rico, and he's going to talk about disturbance in, in Lucio. Uh, thank you. Well, first, I'd like to say thank everyone for the invitation. You all have been incredibly gracious hosts, and this has probably been one of the most fun and interesting visits that I've ever had to a university where I've been able to talk to students and faculty and uh, about stuff that I think is really cool and hopefully that they think is really cool. And, and I think you have a really good group of people here, so I've been really quite, quite impressed. Um, thank you. So usually I run out of time, and so I didn't want to run out of time at all in this, in this particular presentation because most of the research that I'm going to talk about today arises from 30 years of interactions with tons of people in the QLTR site. And to, to quote a very famous um, previous First Lady and Secretary of State, you know, it takes a village of collaborators to run an LTER site. And, and really, it gets to the point where you interact so much with so many people, it's hard to distinguish your thoughts from their thoughts. And maybe that doesn't matter anyways because it's our thoughts. And so the point of all this is, you know, my name is at the bottom here, but really there's so many people that need to be acknowledged that um, I would be remiss to not say that from the get-go. Uh, a little bit of what I hope to do today is to uh, give you a sense of the Lucio Experimental Forest in Puerto Rico as the site of the research that I'll talk about, um, present a little bit about the conceptual foundations or the themes or the focal areas around which our research is organized, uh, and, and then conclude with some ecological vignettes that are more personal that reflect my particular research activities in the Lucia Forest as it relates back to uh, gradients in general and disturbance as well, and do so uh, from the population level, the community level, and the meta community level. So, first, a sense of site. After all, we are a long term ecological research site, and, and there's incredible depth and breadth that comes from having deep understanding of uh, a particular site that we've been able to follow over time. So you can, I always tell my students about long-term ecological research. Most ecologists study a movie and they try to understand the plot and the main characters, but they do so by looking at a single slide and in fact, the left-hand corner. And from that they deduce the protagonist, the antagonist, the plot, and the outcome. That would be a silly way to understand a movie. It's also a silly way to understand long -term the way species and communities interact with each other. And so this is really a privilege to have this deep site-based understanding uh, of ecological patterns and processes. But I want to give you a sense of the site. Uh, Puerto Rico lies at the fulcrum between the greater and lesser Antilles. It contains floral and faunal elements of, of both. Uh, the work in, in the Lequeo Experimental Forest occurs in northwestern Puerto Rico, which uh, arguably is the longest standing protected area in the New World. It was established by the King of Spain when 
when both the Spanish colonized the area. And so it has a long history of being preserved and reserved uh, for um, various kinds of activities, but hasn't been modified as much as many areas in the Caribbean have been by human activities. Uh, as we go from the coast of the Caribbean uh, to the peaks in the Luquillo Mountains, of a distance of less than 10 miles, we have incredible uh, topographic relief illustrated by this graph. And concordant with that elevational relief, we can identify three distinct forest types based upon species composition and physiognomy, Tabanuco forest, Polo Colorado forest, and Elfin forest. Those are elevationally structured forest types. We have a fourth forest type called palm forest. Uh, and palm forest occurs throughout the entire elevational gradient. It is more of an adaptive forest type that occurs um, in a dendritic or patch-like basis throughout the uh, area. Uh, this is just to give you a quick view of, of some salient environmental characteristics that vary uh, with in the ex Cleo experimental forest. Uh, and, and, and the point is not only do they vary sort of topographically, they vary over time. So the, the Cleo experimental forest, even though the tropics is often considered to be this stable, unchanging kind of environment, you can see that at least we're within the scale of the Cleo experimental forest, it's quite dynamic spatially and temporally. Um, also, as you all know, uh, Puerto Rico lies in the hurricane belt, and notice that the, the trajectory of Hurricane uh, Georges here also overlapped with Florida, so we have many things in common, that is Luquillo and, 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 uh, and, and your long-term ecological research site here in the Everglades. But you know, we consider all Puerto Rican ecosystems to be disturbance media. The fauna is well adapted to um, disturbances that are initiated by climatic activities, and so we see very different kinds of activities in these kinds of systems compared to, let's say, those that are less subject to as many intense and uh, disturbances as we have in the Caribbean. Uh, hurricanes have incredible impact. You guys already know that living in, in this part of the world. But this is a nice diagram that shows how, in a period of two days, the forest can change. This, this, period, this photo was taken two days before Hurricane Hugo, the one on the left. The one after Hurricane Hugo was right after the storm had passed. Uh, incredible devastation and alteration of the uh, structure and biomass distribution in the forest. And not only are hurricane impacts dramatic and quick, recovery is also rapid and dramatic. So this is a picture of uh, a different site but close by that shows what it looked like uh, after Hurricane Hugo and what it looked five years later. So very quickly, secondary successional processes, again, alter the landscape. It's incredibly dynamic temporally. So given that is the, is the site of the research that I'll talk about in, in general, now I want to talk at least briefly about some of the <laughs> concepts or, that underlie many of the activities that we undertake in Luquillo to a greater or lesser extent. Uh, and I would start off by saying this was not the perspective that we took in the first LTER project. In the first, for the, I guess we're in our fifth renewal. Uh, in the first years, the first years, our focus was really on the central part of this diagram. That is, we want to understand how ecosystems were affected by disturbances and then recovered. So we were looking at sort of disturbance and recovery, past generating phenomena, and how these determine the structure and function of the forest. And as our site matured, I guess, intellectually, and as we got probably, truthfully, greater and greater pressure from funding agencies to, to increase human dimensions in our understanding, it became clear, obviously, that, that anthropogenic activities were also altering this dynamic between uh, intact and degraded systems. Uh, and as we get even further along, we, we recognize that whether they're intact systems or degraded systems or whatever, those are qualitative words, and I guess they're also judgments. Uh, but we're, we're stuck with the English language here. Uh, but, but all of those ecosystems provide services to humans. And, and the real missing link in this system, this, this coupled human natural system, is how knowledge of human well-being feeds back to human decision making. making. And I think that's the key to sustainability. We're nowhere near it, Lukio, to understanding this. My guess is we're not anywhere near to understanding this in most systems. And I think that's really the challenge that as, as ecologists and biologists and environmental scientists we have uh, as we come into the 21st century, where it's clear that the, the, the degradative process is increasing dramatically. Uh, the Lukio experimental forest is subject to a disturbance regime. A disturbance regime has multiple elements. Uh, I've listed some of the elements to the disturbance regime, tropical storms, landslides, tree falls, 
forestry and agricultural activities, urbanization. Some of them are more or less natural. Some of these are more or less anthropogenic in origin. And each of those elements of the disturbance regime has characteristic signatures that are related to the frequency with which they occur, the intensity with which they occur, the spatial extent over which they occur, and ultimately, if you're looking at the response of the biota or the response of the biogeochemical system, the severity of impacts that those disturbances may or may not have on the systems of interest. And so this, in a nutshell, if there was one word that we wanted to say characterized the Lukiwa experimental forest, it's understanding the word disturbance in its full ramification. Uh, and we, it, well, we started LTER-1 a year before Hurricane Hugo hit. And our thoughts at that time were that tree falls and landslides were the dominant disturbances that structured that forest. And before we even got all of our pre-data collected, Hurricane Hugo came, and as you see, had a dramatic alteration of, the, of all the habitats in the Lakeo Experimental Forest. And what became really immediately obvious to us, not only do the things like hurricanes have an immediate effect, they also alter the frequency of other kinds of disturbances that come later by modifying geomorphological and habitat characteristics. So disturbances generate other disturbances. So you know, a hurricane has an immediate impact, but it also may affect the, the geomorphology of the area and the, the amount of living plants in particular areas. So the next time a heavy rain comes, you get a rain, landslide. And, or the, the hurricane came, and it subsequently it broke off the, the, the canopy of some of the trees, and they fall over uh, because they're, they're, they're weakened, or they have, uh, because of stress associated with the destruction, they are more prone to have pathogens attack them. Uh, and of course, it also influences decisions whether to harvest or not. You know, that, that immediate post-Hugo forest is unlikely to have any selective harvesting going on for quite some while. So it's really clear that disturbances uh, create other disturbances and alter disturbance regimes. And so, you know, as we, as we look back and think about global climate change, it's not only sort of warming up the environment, it's arguably changing disturbance regimes as well by affecting arguably, let's say, the frequency of intense storms um, as they might impact particular areas like Puerto Rico. Even if the total number is staying constant, the frequency of intense storms may be increasing. And so the whole dynamic of the disturbance regime may be changing as well. And so we think we're, we're uniquely poised in the Q experimental force to understand these dynamics. And there's two attributes of responses to disturbance we're particularly interested in. One of them is resistance, the other is resilience. And these five little cartoons try to illustrate conceptually the differences between those two. Uh, the, the, the blue labeled uh, diagrams represent resistance, which is, as the word implies in English, it's the, the, the likelihood that the system doesn't change very much. So the smaller the arrow that connects the pre-disturbance black dot to the post-disturbance gray dot, the less displacement there was, the less effect there was. And so A is more resistant to the disturbance than was B because it has changed less immediately after the disturbance. And so obviously more resistant systems are ones that are less changing over time, to some extent. In blue, there's another attribute of what the biota does when confronted with the disturbances. What happens post-disturbance? So you have, for example, in the, in the lower sequence of blue labeled slides, um, C, D, and E, a disturbance that displaces the system equally in all three cases. So they were equally resistant, right? But the subsequent trajectories of return are quite different. Those, here the pattern is the same, but here it took three time periods, here it took four. So we would say that three, I'm sorry, C was more resilient than D because it got back to pre-disturbance conditions more quickly than did D. And one might also argue that there's differences in the trajectories, the actual physical or, or biological mapping of those changes. So even though D and E are equally uh, resilient based upon time to recovery, they took markedly different paths to getting there. And so we're interested in seeing the generality of these concepts as, as systems respond to hurricanes of different intensities, tree falls, uh, human activities, whatever, whatever it may be. So a bunch of what we do in Lokiu is try to understand resistance and resilience of systems, what characteristics of systems are more resilient than others, what species contribute to that resilience or resistance more than others, so that we can understand uh, dynamics. And of course, these kinds of information can also inform management decisions, because in a sense, what is management? It's the application of disturbances toward a human desired end. And so understanding resistance and resilience is really understanding how humans can modify environments to make them more like the way we want them to be and to stay that way more 
it, over time because uh, we pick systems that resist change or that are resilient to it once it's happened. So these kinds of <laughs> studies, although foundational from a biological perspective or a scientific perspective, have tremendous uh, reference to applied studies of conservation and management. So the, the little diagram here, sorry, little, little diagram here to the left is a cartoon trying to show here's an initial state in black, a disturbance happens, it has a certain amount of resistance, it goes to this particular party, and each of these other vectors represent, let's say, an annual sequence of changes in species composition until it returns to that point. And that's how we talked about the forms. There was disturbance in recovery with the expectation that things recovered. They went back to the way they were. They were resilient. And, and this was our view of the forest prior to Hurricane Hugo, that there was a whole bunch of sites, let's say throughout Tabanuco Forest, that were more or less alike. But there were some sites that were a little different because a tree falls, and, and they displaced those sites a little bit from this central core. And there were some other sites that were fairly different, but they were fewer in number than represented landslides. But consistently, areas that were in landslides were recovering back to this matrix, or these tree falls were recovering back to the matrix. And then Hurricane Hugo came and really changed our view of what that forest looked like. So this was a forest that geographically was Swiss cheese. It was mostly matrix with a bunch of holes in it that represented landslides and tree falls. Then the Hurricane Hugo came by and it was like, well actually, it's mostly a whole bunch of holes and little pieces of cheese that are connecting them. And it turned the sort of the cheese analogy inside out. And it really altered the sort of composition and configuration of the forest. And this particular diagram illustrates that. And as we've come to understand that what happens at a particular site is not only related to the characteristics of the site, it's also related to the suite of sites that surround it. And so the composition and configuration of this whole landscape becomes incredibly important. And we develop models to try to understand you know, what were the factors that would drive succession. So this is the choo-choo train model of succession where you have a site uh, represented by the, the rectangle and it has a certain suite of characteristics, the abiotic characteristics, the biotic characteristics, and the structural characteristics represented by A, B, and S, respectively, to the wheels of the train. A disturbance comes in, and it pushes the train forward. It changes its location. What determines where it changes the location to? Well, it depends upon the state of these three wheels, as well as the particular disturbance. But notice this, this, this original model, although, I mean, interesting and somewhat informative, failed, failed to include consideration of the surrounding landscape. It's become increasingly important in Lukio that we've understood that that's a, this is a naive model that's sort of uh, really non-spatial in its characteristics. And we really need to have um, models developed that not only consider fine scale characteristics that are, for example, what's happening at the particular site to understand how the site's changing over time, but we have to understand how that site's embedded in the broad matrix to understand influences because things can be rescued from the surrounding matrix. And, and, and processes change based upon the permeability of that matrix to the content of the site that you're interested in. And so the extent to which these fine scale patterns interact with these broad scale patterns complicate our understanding of disturbance and recovery, but, but force us truly to consider the forest and the concept, and the, rather in the context of a, of a landscape. <coughs> And, and finally, from a conceptual position, and as a biologist, I'm, I'm really interested in the abundance and distribution of organisms. I want to understand how, how disturbances, even disturbances like, if you want to consider climate change a disturbance because it has an, it arguably has an anthropogenic origin. We can understand so via this diagram, I think, uh, where any species has a fundamental niche, and a fundamental niche is indicated for species A by this gray ellipse by a second species B is this fundamental niche. And so the, the white shaded ellipses represent fundamental niches. The unshaded ellipses represent the suite of ecological space represented by your study site. So these are the e combinations of environmental characteristic one and two, let's say in Tabanuco forest. These are the niche requirements of each of those two species. What does this tell us? Within the forest, there should be um, four kinds of sites. Sites without those two species, sites with both of those species, in sites with one or the other species, right? What happens if, for example, climate change comes along and alters 
ecological space in the Lakeo Mountains so that the environmental characteristics in the Tabanuco Forest change. Well, if it altered those distribution of sites, let's say to the upper left, what would happen? We'll still have the two species in the Lakeo Experimental Forest, but they'll never be synoptic, right? You'll have either one or the other or none. They'll never be co-occurring together, changing species interactions. What happens if we had altered it to the left? Well, in this particular example, there'd again be two kinds of spaces. One species goes extinct locally, and species, only one of the species, what is it, species um, B, persists in the forest. So changing environmental characteristics anywhere will change the mapping of species' fundamental niches onto the environmental spaces that are available to them, altering the composition of local communities and to the extent that species interactions drive biological processes or environmental processes will alter the characteristics of those sites as well. So we think we have sort of a pretty broad conceptual background from which to understand a variety of factors that affect the distribution and abundance of organisms and the uh, rates of processing of nutrients and, and, and energy in our system. So, so I think we've kind of matured to a, in, a, in, a, in many ways in trying to understand how species respond to disturbances and how the, what the consequences of those responses might be uh, to the functioning of ecosystems. Uh, what I want to do in the, in the remainder of the time that I have available is to talk about some, some ecological vignettes that relate to biodiversity gradients. Because remember, because of the topograph, topographic relief, because of human-generated activities, and potentially because of climate change, we're going to have spatial variation in environmental characteristics. And that's a big challenge to which organisms must respond. And we can detect those responses at at least these three different levels in the ecological hierarchy, the level of populations, communities, and, and metacommunities. So I'm going to talk about uh, a research project that focuses on biodiversity gradients. These have been, one could say in ecology, some of the most pervasive and influential studies because they've looked at things like species area curves, latitudinal gradients, productivity diversity relationships. These gradients can be spatial or environmental in nature. <coughs> uh, we're interested in the patterns, the mechanisms that give rise to them and the consequences of them. And, and here are some of the, I guess, more prominent uh, kinds of biodiversity gradients that you all may be familiar with. I'm going to talk about elevational gradients. Elevation is a spatial gradient. Species aren't saying, hey, it's 300 meters in elevation. I want to live here. But they may be living at 300 because the temperature and the precipitation is, is, fits within the fundamental niches. So, so we realize that this spatial gradient called elevation is really a surrogate for a bunch of environmental characteristics that change in tandem and, in fact, monotonically in some cases with elevation. And we also know that within a relatively short distance, we can get dramatic changes in microclimatic and abiotic characteristics that you'd have to travel hundreds of miles to get in a, in a, um, in a latitudinal kind of experiment. So you can get dramatic environmental gradients in relatively short spaces. And in addition to having these gradual changes, for example, in temperature and precipitation that I illustrated in those, gra those, those um, uh, isoplates for various environmental characteristics, we also have forest zonation happening. So there's two kinds of variation in the Keel Mountains that I can talk about that are somewhat different from each other. Continuous variation in, let's say, these, bio, these um, bioclimatic characteristics and then discrete variation that's reflected in zonation. And since I study animals, I'm going to talk about the distinction between whether the animals are primarily responding to these continuous abiotic gradients, or in fact, are they responding more generally to these discrete habitat types that are represented by forest associations. The other thing that's cool about latitude, or I'm sorry, elevational gradients is the role of historical contingency won't um, complicate the story. Uh, so uh, that species will more or less have a common species pool. If I'm studying distribution of bats in the Caribbean, I have to worry about whether the particular island I'm studying is close to Florida, close to Cancun, or close to Venezuela, because the species pool of bats that could colonize those sites are much different. So differences among islands might not have anything to do with the islands. It might have to do with their proximity to sources of colonization. In these mountain systems, uh, it's highly unlikely that those kinds of problems would crop up. Also, there's far fewer systematic challenges because it's a single fauna that's being ex uh, explored. And so you have some likelihood of having fewer species to have to understand taxonomically. And so it makes it an efficient system within to work, as well as a, a, an interesting one for challenging biodiversity. The conceptual model that I'll try to explore is as follows. 
Uh, elevation, if the spatial gradient causes gradual changes in temperature and precipitation. Temperature and precipitation has an impact on the composition and physiognomy of plants. And then either these abiotic gradients directly or the plant community direct or indirectly has impact on animal populations, communities, and meta-community dynamics. And what I hope to do is distinguish the likely effects of the things that are in green from the likely effects of the things that are in blue because of a distinctive experimental design that we were able to employ in the Lakeo Experimental Forest. So, um, I'm again going to talk in the rest of the talk a little bit about the experimental design, then talk about the responses at the population level, the community level, and the meta community level. Uh, we're, we're focusing on the Lakeo Experimental Forest, and so this is the real forest. <laughs> This is my cartoon version of it, and it illustrates the experimental design. So as we go from about, well, as we go from close to the uh, to sea level to the peaks of the mountains, we have pairs of sites represented by the circles. Uh, the circles that are in gray represent palm forests, and remember those palm forest <coughs> sites occur throughout the elevational gradient, and they're paired with other sites that correspond to Tabanuco, Polo Colorado, or Elfin Forest. So we have two parallel transects. We call one the mixed forest transect because it transgresses through three different forest types, whereas the, the palm forest transect is only in palm, and they're, and they're matched. So this represents a sort of a powerful experimental design for trying to explore things that change along the elevational gradient regardless of forest type, and things that change between forest types regardless of elevation because they're paired sites. So this pairing of the sites is critical for distinguishing sort of ostensibly the, the, the effects of the abiotic world versus the effects of forest zonation on, on animal population and communities. Uh, so in mixed forest, we have 15 strata. Uh, they vary at every 50 meters from 300 to 1,000 meters in elevation. We essentially have the same distribution in uh, palm forest, except we couldn't find a palm forest patch at 750 meters, so we don't have that one present. We constrained our work for logistical reasons uh, to be within a single watershed, the Sonadora watershed, and the, the location of actual uh, sites uh, along that transect are represented here, where the red represents palm patches and the black represents Tabanuco, Palo Colorado, or dwarf forest sites. At, at each of those elevations, we had 10 quadrats. Each quadrat contained a circular plot. The circular plot had a uh, radius of three meters, and because mixed forest sites are, are expansive, we could sort of organize them in this nice two by five kind of array. Palm patches are irregular in shape and smaller in size, and so we had to change the configuration. But the maximum distance between any two sites here and the maximum distance between two sites here don't vary a whole lot. So our hope is that that difference in configuration doesn't play a massive role in the differences in the results that we get. It could, but I think given biological knowledge of these, these or the organisms in the system, I, I, I think that that's unlikely to be the case. And my focus is on, will be on gastropods, snails, and slugs. Uh, there's lots of reasons to do so. They're locally abundant. They're reasonably species rich. They're functionally important because of the role in decomposition and nutrient cycling. Uh, previous work has shown that these organisms respond at the population and community level to habitat heterogeneity. And they also respond to disturbances, tree falls, anthropogenic land use, and hurricanes. So we thought that they were sort of the, the um, uh, Arabidopsis of tropical ecology. They were model organisms for exploring uh, biological diversity in the system. Uh, there are about 16 species of gastropod that, that, are, that are macro snails that occur above the litter. Uh, this is an important point because these are long-term ecological sites. We don't go out and disturb the habitat every time we search for snails. So these are the snails that emerge from the litter or from this habitat and are seen essentially at, at ground level up to about um, uh, nine feet in height. Uh, in all cases, we, we documented the, the species and their abundances in the wet season of 2008 by doing three surveys that occurred from about, well, not from about, from 10 o'clock at night till 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, it was all non-destructive sampling because we couldn't mark all of the snails uh, effectively so that we would have unique numbers. Our estimates of 
of abundances are based upon the minimum number known alive during each of those three surveys, which is in fact the maximum number that you detected in any of those three surveys. So we know that there's at least that many there, individuals that are there. We have been able to um, do more recapture studies of two of the gastropods, Caracolis, Caracola, and Nenia tridens, um, both of which I think are shown here. Uh, this is Nenia tridens. Uh, this is Caracolis, Caracola. They're able to be marked, and there's, a, there's like 0.96 is the correlation between variation and minimum number known alive and more sophisticated mark recapture kind of estimates. So, Relative, we, we hope that that's sufficient evidence, at least for those that we can, ex for which we can explore it, that minimum number known alive can at least detect relative changes in abundance over time, if not the absolute changes in abundance over time. And so now I want to talk about, given this fauna and the ways in which we estimated their abundances, what can we do to explore population level variation? And I'm going to take a little bit of time to explain this particular graphic because it's going to reappear over and over again. <laughs> and, and so if you get this one, it will help you to understand all the ones that follow. So we, we have a really nice hierarchical design where we have um, two factors, transect, mix versus palm, and that's represented by T, transect. And we have elevation at every 50 meters represented by E. And we have their interaction, the transects by elevation interaction. And so we, we, we did uh, uh, appropriate quantitative analyses uh, based upon those data. And, and whether the, the letters are red tell you what's significant or not. So in this particular example, there's a significant interaction between transect and elevation. That is, elevation has an impact on the total abundance of gastropods, but the way in which it impacts them depends upon the transect. And there's two ways you can have an interaction a positive synergism or a negative synergism. And this particular example is illust illustrates a positive synergism. That is, the, 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 the elevational gradient in the mixed forest and the elevational gradient in the palm forest don't intersect. Right? So in this example, the dashed line represents the palm forest with the associated open circles being palm forest and squares, diamonds, I'm sorry, square circles and diamonds representing uh, Elfin Forest, Polo Colorado Forest, and Tabanuco Forest. The filled symbols represent those that come from mixed forest. And so these best fit lines through the data for the mixed forest and the palm forest transects um, do not intersect, but they have different slopes. So the rate at which abundance decreases with increasing elevation is sharper in the uh, palm forest than it is in the mixed forest. So it's a positive synergism, but they don't interact. They don't revert. There's not a reversal. Palm forest always has more individuals than does mixed forest transect. But the relative differences in abundance change as we go up the mountain. So this is an example of uh, a population level response, if you will, that's composite among all individuals. And, we, and so this is important because we'll come back to this later, but we want to see the extent to which this sort of composite is the consequence of variation in the species whose frequencies of occurrence are sufficient that we can actually conduct meaningful statistical analyses. And so I'm not going to show you graphs for all of these species, but what I'm going to tell you is that, whoops, um, here's the summary of the results for total abundance that I just showed you. There was a significant interaction so I don't interpret the other main effects. Uh, and if these are individual names of species. Uh, notice that all but one species, Oleocinia playa, responded to elevation in a consistent way, i.e. elevation was significant with no interaction, or elevation had an effect but it was in a, via its interaction with transect. And in fact, all interactions are positive synergism, so the slopes aren't interacting with each other. So clearly, elevation is having a strong impact in molding the abundance of these snails. And the sign here next to the species name is telling you how abundances are changing with increased in elevation. So in this case, all but one species is decreasing in abundance as you go up in elevation. Transect similarly has a significant effect on all but two species, either through consistent effects or via its interaction with elevation. And in fact, in all cases, in all cases, abundance is higher in palm forest than it is in matched mixed forest. And that's what we saw from before. 
So here we have a really nice and consistent story where all the species that are sufficiently frequent are responding in quite similar ways to elevation and quite similar ways to um, differences between the mixed forest and the palm forest transect. So that in summary, all but one species decreases in abundance with increasing elevation. Most species enjoy higher abundance in palm forest than in non-palm forest. For most species, elevational trends are parallel and mixed in palm forest. And when they're not parallel, they still don't inter intersect. And total abundance follows these same trends. So now we want to, to sort of move to the next level in biological organization, to the community level that's a, that represents a composite of all these factors coming together. And as probably you all know, taxonomic biodiversity has multiple components. You can look at richness, dominance, evenness, diversity, rarity. But all of them are just metrics to attempt to explain the shape of this species abundance distribution, this rank abundance distribution. So for example, richness is just the total length of, the, of this distribution. Dominance is the relative proportion of the highest bar in the species abundance distribution. Um, Rarity is the number of species that have more than you would expect on average a species to have given the total number of species. So if species all have the same abundance, the relative abundances would be one over S. And so any species with less than one over S is its relative abundance is considered rare, and we count the number that fall within this uh, yellow area, that's rarity. Uh, diversity is a composite measure that depends upon both richness and evenness. And even this is a measurement of the extent to which all the species have one over S as their relative abundance. So they're all equally abundant. So these are just all ways of characterizing the shape of this distribution. And we've used those five metrics to, to look at species abundance distributions and to see how they respond to elevation and transect using that exact same experimental design and those exact same data. And the results were surprisingly simple. There were no interactions. In all cases, there were elevational gradients and aspects of biodiversity. And in three cases, richness, diversity, and rarity, there were significant transect effects. Remember, obviously, richness is sensitive to the number of species. Rarity is sensitive to the number <coughs> of species. And diversity is sensitive to the number of species. So those metrics of biodiversity that responded to transect are those that contain within them some sensitivity to variation in richness. Those related to, to that are more susceptible to variation in the relative abundance of individuals within species did not show the transect effect. Um, the sign tells us that those indices of biodiversity that are sensitive to richness decrease with increasing elevation, whereas those that are sensitive to the relative abundance of individuals increase with increasing elevation. And I am going to show you slides of these at least reasonably quickly to give you an understanding of what's going on. So, for richness and rarity, there was no interaction. These two lines should be considered parallel. There's a consistent transect effect. Um, palm forest always has higher richness and rarity than does uh, mixed forest transect. And the rate at which we lose species with increasing elevation in mixed forest and palm forest is the same. The rate at which we lose rare species is the same in those two forest types as well. The exact same pattern is reflected in diversity, although those lines look like they're not parallel. Statistically, they're indistinguishable from each other, so we have the same relationships. Diversity is highest in palm forest, and the rate of change in, in the number of, in diversity decreases as we go up in elevation. Dominance and evenness uh, show an even more simple relationship. Uh, not only are those lines parallel, they're coincident. Uh, and the, the one for uh, dominance might not look like it's coincident, but statistically, they're indistinguishable from each other. So uh, elevation is having a consistent effect on dominance and evenness, and those metrics increase with increasing elevation. So, in, so in, oh, so I wanted to go back. So, so now we have these sort of contrasting patterns about biodiversity. I've already, already hinted that two things might be important, the relative abundance of individuals, which richness and rarity don't measure, and, and dominance and evenness. So now I wanted to go back and look at my original results and see what would happen if I controlled for variation in total abundance among sites. Testing, um, well, t testing species effects uh, that, are, that are dominant in that case. So this is a little bit of a, this is a reasonably complicated diagram, but hopefully it'll just take you a minute to understand it. Um, the values that are underlined 
or significant in the original analysis. The values that are in this, uh, these p-values that are present in the, in the chart that's here are the p-values that were obtained after running the same analysis as before, but with total abundance as a covariate. And what you see is that many of the things that were significant in the original analysis that didn't have the covariate disappear. Their significance goes away. In fact, in what, one, two, three, four, five, in six cases, the significance that was attributed to transected elevation in these aspects of biodiversity are no longer in, taken, or no longer apparent once we control for variation and abundance. Um, and that, what, only two remain significant as they were before. And notice that those were two of the metrics that were still sensitive to variation in relative abundances rather than total abundances. So my point here is that whatever it is that's driving variation in total abundance or that's driving variation in the total abundance of any particular species also is driving variation in many of these metrics of biodiversity. So that perhaps the same mechanism as underlying population level and community level responses uh, and, and doing so in a consistent fashion. And so in summary, for community level analyses, all components of biodiversity consistently varied with elevation, richness sensitive components differed between transects, and that elevational and transect effects on richness sensitive components relate to variation in abundance, why their significance goes away when you do an analysis of covariance. So it's implying that the total number of individuals or factors that give rise to variation in the total number of individuals is playing a dominant role uh, in understanding biodiversity variation in this site. Now what I want to do is, ha after having spoken about population and community level responses, is move on to a, a consideration of how metacommunity structure varies along this elevational gradient, or maybe more specifically, how does metacommunity organization differ along the mixed forest and palm forest uh, transects. And a metacommunity approach recognizes that different sites indicated by these large circles are connected to each other by the movement of individuals of different species. So the smaller circles are species, their color tells you their species identity. And the arrows just say individuals move from one site to another, which is a process that would tend to homogenize sites. And then habitat matching, for example, might be a process that would make the sites be distinctive from each other. So if you're uh, a halophytic species and you like salty habitats and you, and you move into a habitat that's salty, you may go away or you die. If you have, if, and so we have this sort of this balance between filtering and random processes determining the abundance and distribution of species among sites within the meta community. And what we're interested in is not the structure in any one of the communities or at any one of the sites. We don't, we don't I say we don't care. I'm not going to be talking in a meta community approach. I'm not trying to characterize this site or this site or this site. I'm trying to characterize the suite of sites that together is the meta community. So it's an emergent property that arises from a simultaneous consideration of all the sites uh, within the domain of interest. And to, to do the analysis, you essentially, um, all you need, at least initially, is a, a species incidence matrix. So for each of the sites indicated by rows, we know whether each of a number of species is present or absent. Zero is absent, one is present. So this is a species incidence matrix, matrix, and we ordinate that matrix via some sort of uh, data reduction approach or, or, or factor analysis. In this particular case, we use reciprocal averaging because it has some nice properties. Reciprocal averaging is a, is a methodology that essentially places species with similar spatial distributions adjacent to each other in the matrix and sites with similar species composition adjacent to each other in the matrix. And so it, it takes this data and rearranges it in a way um, that similar sites are adjacent to each other because of their species composition, and sites, species are adjacent to each other because of their similar spatial distributions. And then we use this ordinated matrix as the basis for all the analyses that follow. And we look at three characteristics of those ordinated matrix coherence, turnover, and monetary clumping. Um, and I think it's, I won't go into the details about exactly what those elements are, but I try to illustrate them with a cartoon. So species are responding to an environmental gradient in a coherent way, that if I can live at 10 degrees and I can live at 12 degrees, I ought to be able to live at 11 degrees, right? So there should be no holes in my distribution along the gradients. 
And so coherence is a measurement of the extent to which there, are, there is continuity in the distribution of species with regard to an environmental gradient. So the top species, this, whoops, the top species has a very coherent distribution, whereas the bottom species, although it has the same frequency of occurrence, it occurs in three sites, there are two intervening sites that it should be present, but it wasn't. So this species is more coherent in its distribution than is this. But in a meta-community context, coherence is a measurement <coughs> of the extent to which all of the species are responding to the same latent environmental gradient in this fashion. So it doesn't look in a species-specific manner. It says, we've identified a latent environmental gradient through reciprocal averaging. That's the rank order of the sites from the analysis. And then we explore how many zeros intervene in the ones in the spatial distribution defined by that matrix. The idea being, if there is coherence, that is, there's fewer zeros than you'd expect due to chance alone, that the, a large number of species in the meta community are responding to the same environmental gradient. And so it makes sense to talk about their structure with respect to an environmental gradient, because all meta community analyses identify a gradient. The, the next concept is species turnover. Species turnover is the extent to which species, uh, one species ends its distribution when another one begins it. So it basically takes the ordinated matrix, it looks at all possible four-way pairs, and it looks for situations like the one I have here on the left, where here we have a species present, that one's absent. It now is no longer present, but the other one comes in. So where one ends, another <laughs> one begins. And it counts those things, whereas in this analysis, that this particular yellow square does not indicate species turnover because it's reciprocal. A ends where B begins. And so again, it, it looks at a metric that tries to understand by chance alone what would you expect the distribution of turnovers to be in an ordinated matrix. And finally, you look at boundary clumping. And boundary clumping is simply measured as essentially the number of termini for species distributions that occur at any one site. And as a consequence, notice that here are these two species that end exactly in this spot. These two species end exactly in that spot. They create compartments. What happens in those compartments? Within a compartment, there's compositional unity. But between compartments, there's compositional dissimilarity. And that's in contrast to the example that I've shown over here, where you can't really see either of those two things happening, <coughs> compositional unity or intercompartmental dissimilarity. So we, we quantify coherent species turnover and boundary clumping, clumping by uh, a large number of statistical approaches. I won't go into them now. And we use these three elements uh, to try to distinguish among different kinds of structures. And that, uh, the, the structures that we'll distinguish are the one, six that are indicated here on the left, random distributions, checkerboards, nested subsets, Clementsian distributions, Gleasonian distributions, and evenly spaced distributions. But you've all probably heard of well, the old debate between Clements and Gleason about how communities were organized and talked about. Um, well, unfortunately, Clements identified a mechanism that's no longer really held as to being one that's in operation. But the pattern still persists, that there are discrete compartments. So when we say Clementsian distributions, we mean ones that have discrete compartments. Whereas Gleason said that individual species respond to gradients in idiosyncratic fashions, so their co-occurrences are independent of each other. And, and so they're, they're random with respect to each other, but not random with respect to the environmental gradient. Um, and we do this based on the ordinated incidence matrix. And so I'm going to try to show you a cartoon for each of these kinds of structures, not so that you deeply understand or exactly understand what I mean by them, but get, start to get a feel for uh, what these meta-community structures might look like. So this is an example of a random distribution where the presences and absence of species are, are displayed at random within the matrix. Notice that within any one species, there's a lot of holes in its spatial distribution, suggesting that um, species have a random spatial distribution unrelated to the primary gradient that we're looking at. Why? Because there's lots of holes in their spatial distribution. As opposed to checkerboards, you might have heard of checkerboards. Diamond talked about checkerboards in the Avifaun in the Caribbean, and he would identify pairs of species where you had A or B, but never both, and they kind of flip-flop back and forth. And so creating a checkerboard like the one that I've shown here for the black pair of species. Um, but in a meta-community concept, checkerboard distributions arise when pairs of species have these mutually exclusive distributions, 
And they themselves are independent of other such species that have mutually exclusive distributions. So notice the dark gray species also has a pair of mutually exclusive distributions, totally unrelated to these species. And the light gray ones also have mutually exclusive spatial distribution. So checkerboards aren't a measurement of any one particular pair of species, but it's a meta-community-wide analysis of pairwise distributions that are mutually exclusive. So it's like checkerboards in the diamond sense, but not exactly the same. Nested subsets occur when um, one is at one end of the environmental gradient contain, for example, most of the species in the, in the fauna or the flora. And as we go in one direction along the gradient, we progressively lose species so that uh, sites at one end of the gradient are perfect subsets of all the other sites. So for example, if you occur at this end of the gradient, then all the species at this end will occur at these other ends. But any, and any species find at any other location must occur here. So they're perfect subsets of each other. They form this kind of stair-step kind of appearance when you plot them in this fashion. Clementian means there's discrete uh, compartments that I already sort of, I think, explained that one reasonably well. Gleasonians, where species are responding to the environmental gradient, but they're doing so in an idiosyncratic fashion. Evenly spaced, again, species are responding to the environmental gradient, but they're, it's been hy hypothesized by um, Tillman that in, in systems that are highly structured by interspecific competition when nutrients are limiting, that species will tend to have <coughs> equivalent amplitudes of their distribution with respect, with respect to the environmental gradient, and they'll form perfectly interdigitating line segments like the ones I illustrated here. The advantages of this approach is that we can then use the quantification of coherence, turnover, and boundary clumping to characterize checkerboards, random, nested subsets, evenly spaced, Gleasonian, and Clementian distributions. So this is a decision tree. You do the three analyses with respect to the three elements of meta-community structure, and from that you can distinguish these six <coughs> kinds of meta-community organization. And we also can distinguish quasi-structures, but I'm not going to talk about those to great extent now. So this, the approach I'm talking about today has a a lot of advantages over previous approaches, which ask the question, are you nested or are you not? When you said something wasn't nested, you inferred that it was random. So it could have been Clementian, Gleasonian, even, nested, so on and so forth. So it wasn't a very powerful approach. And these previous approaches, like the nested calculator for looking at um, nestedness, obviously, required you a priori to define the environmental gradient. And the gradient was species richness. And here you don't have to d identify uh, that environmental gradient. In fact, you can look at correlative approaches to try to understand uh, to what it is that the latent environmental gradient responds. So I think it has uh, some statistical properties that make it more useful, and it also has some environmental characteristics that make it more informative, perhaps, than these other approaches. Uh, so my predictions are that if species are responding, if gastropods are primarily responding to the abiotic gradient, then they should have a Gleasonian kind of pattern along the elevational gradient. Each species responds idiosyncratically to whatever it is that's varying up along the environmental gradient. In contrast, if species are responding to forest structure that arises um, from those distinctive zones of Tabanuco, Polo, Colorado, and, and uh, dwarf forest, then you ought to get Clementian structure. But you would only get it in the mixed forest transect. You wouldn't get it in the palm forest transect because there's only one forest type. So one transect is, is, I'm sorry, two of the transects, both of the transects, are sensitive to the abiotic gradient, but only one of them is, has any uh, biotic variation in the flora. Uh, that, that's an overstatement, but that's at least the hypothesis that's here. And again, this is a complicated graphic, but it, it illustrates the, the main points of the analysis. That is, in mixed forest, we did indeed get a Clementian distribution. And in palm forest, we got a quasi Gleasonian distribution. So, um, and, and this was the results of reciprocal averaging. The location of sites in the ordinated metric, a matrix corresponds exactly to their position with respect to axis one. And so we've got distinctive differences between these transects. And to me, that's pretty remarkable because one, um, palm forest and mixed forest quadrats were sometimes less than 100 meters apart. They're all in the same forest type. 
and palm forest is dominated by a single species of palm, Prestoia acuminata, and that species that defines palm forest is ubiquitous and also abundant in each of those mixed forest plots as well. And, and so, and these sites are highly disturbed, as I caught from the earlier, earlier talk. So despite all these things that ought to homogenize meta communities along the elevational gradient, we're still able to distinguish pretty distinctive kinds of structures. We can go back and we can find out that the latent environmental gradient in the mixed forest is correlated with elevation. Latent environmental gradient in the palm forest is correlated with elevation, but the latent environmental gradient in palm forest isn't correlated with that in the mixed forest. So although they're both responding to elevation-related characteristics, they're doing so in different fashions. Or they're responding to different elements of the attributes that are varying with elevation. My, my explanation for how this might happen is illustrated by this cartoon. And this simplifies the real world tremendously, but it's trying to make a point that if we had a system that was Clementsian, i.e. had compartments that had compositional unity and no intercompartmental similarity, such as that on the left, we could have the, the blue compartment, the red compartment, species that, ever, that are everywhere don't tell us much. So this is a pretty clear Clementsian distribution. And this is the kind of distribution we got in the mixed forest transect. But remember that in palm forest, we have more individuals. And we also know from other analyses that have been done that is that uh, productivity, net primary productivity, and litter fall vary in a consistent way between palm forest and mixed forest, i.e. both are higher in palm forest than in mixed forest and they both decrease as we go up in elevation. <clears throat> and so if this is the mapping of species in geographic space or environmental space, uh, but that each of those sites, when we go into the mixed forest transect, has higher productivity. What does that mean? Think of it, there's more energy available for species. They can live in less hospitable environments because they have energy subsidies. Let's call it an energy subsidy. So that although your distribution is limited to here, when energy subsidies are low, when energy subsidies are high, you can expand your distribution elevationally into less optimal habitat. If each species in the palm forest expands its distribution idiosyncratically, some do it a little bit down the mountain, some do it a lot down the mountain, some do it a little bit up the mountain, what started out as a Clementsian distribution could end up being Gleasonian or quasi-Gleasonian because the way they respond to increased productivity is species specific and idiosyncratic. And so we think that variation between palm forest and mixed forest in terms of productivity as it relates to, as I said, litter fall and, and primary production enhances the likelihood that this will happen. And the other thing that I didn't mention was that also palm forest is uh, richer in calcium than is the paired plots in mixed forest and snails need the gastropods need the calcium to create shells, and that there's also an elevational gradient in calcium. And so we think that these are it's a pretty robust prediction about the mechanisms that might give rise to this distinctive Clementsian versus Gleasonian distribution as we go on up in elevation. So the main conclusions here are that mixed forest transects evince a Clementsian structure to one that's highly compartmentalized, or at least reasonably compartmentalized. In contrast, palm forest evinces a quasi-Gleasonian structure, species that are more or less idiosyncratically responding to the environmental gradient. And we hypothesize that these distinctive structures may arise because of differences in total abundance between the transects that are associated with primary, net primary production, litter fall production, and variation in calcium that all vary in consistent ways between transects and along the elevational gradient. And so our, our overarching conclusion then is that elevational variation, as well as edaphic heterogeneity that gives rise to palm forest versus non-palm forest, creates variation in productivity. Productivity affects variation in total abundance. Total abundance has very distinctive effects on community characteristics and meta-community uh, structure. And this is consistent with the more individuals hypothesis, which is an almost null hypothesis that predicts that variation in biodiversity is related to variation in total number of individuals. So that the more individuals that you sample, or the more individuals that you obtain just by chance alone, will increase species richness and increase other metrics of biodiversity as well. So this is one of the few times probably in my career where a, where a single driving concept 
spatial variation in productivity accounts for population community and many community characteristics, does so in a reasonably consistent way, and does so despite incredible spatial and temporal heterogeneity that's imposed on the system by um, disturbance. Uh, uh, so, so with that, uh, I will stop and entertain any questions. Uh, I'm going to skip to here to acknowledge the people in the latter part of the experiment that, that helped with the um, sampling of gastropods and the analyses of data that, that went into this. And to thank you all again for your kind invitation to be here. Thank you. The same sites in the mixed forest transect are higher productivity sites, more than higher densities. Higher, higher densities, sometimes higher numbers of individuals. But they're, they're, so a bunch of things are happening simultaneously. As we get more species, we're often getting a lower um, density of, of certain species and smaller individuals. So the, the thinning process is also happening. But we have, we have this. Plants, plants mapped individually and their biomass is, 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 could be estimated from TBH kinds of measurements in a species specific fashion. Yeah, my question was um, the re rationale behind it was I was wondering if there was a relationship between the diversity of the plants and the total abundance of the plants, much like you found total abundance of gastropods and diversity. So right. Similarly, I would say the answer to that, I mean, I haven't looked at that, but my guess is that since both increase or decrease in, in abundance or richness as you go up, that they would be correlated with each. Certainly non-parametrically, they'd have a very high correlation, I would expect. Um, the other thing is that that's kind of interesting is I don't know if you kind of looked at the gastropodics. We only really saw kind of two compartments, two shaky compartments. I mean, real data are always less clear as the cartoons we draw. But you've got two compartments, which with the trees I mentioned that there were three classical forest types, but a meta-community analysis of the trees actually suggests that that distinction between the, the three is not so clear. There's really kind of two clear ones and then another one that's kind of iffy. It's kind of a, a big transition zone. And so even the number of gastropods that we get, it's also related to kind of the number of compartments that you can distinguish in the, uh, from the tree data as well. So they're, I think they're clearly associated with each other in many, many ways. But we don't see much plant species specificity in the snails, the gastropods. In other words, you don't see one only hangs out in Tabanuco, and one only hangs out in Prestoe, and one only hangs out in Manokara. They seem to be very Catholic in terms of the plants that they hang out on. Um, and they're primarily eating dead or decaying leaves, or the lichens and algae and fungi that are growing on or near those trees. So, so we, we don't have that specificity that might have caused you to expect that one-to-one -one correspondence. Yeah. Sorry, that was a long answer to your question. Any others? On that same point, you might expect that the, <coughs> the um, response to productivity in plants, which are actually the producers, you might, you, you might have a, a different relation the species diversity and therefore it wouldn't just increase the resources and that wouldn't necessarily lead to a higher species diversity. Right, although here we don't have a hump shape curve. We, we have, in fact, we don't even show a sort of a, a decrease in the rate of increase that suggests that if you if the lot were higher, it would, it would go down to a tiny number or go up a in different numbers. So we don't have strong evidence for a mid-elevational peak in diversity. Uh, I'm a social scientist, so this may be a stupid question. Um, but my you know, the, the question is, I mean, the only variables you were looking at to account for this kind of distribution of species was elevation and gradient, Eleva elevation gradient and forest types. But in your, your in your initial uh, conceptual frameworks, I mean, you had disturbance, and you talked about disturbance, 
of anthropogenic and natural, although that's, that's, that distinction is losing its, uh, its distinctiveness. Um, but then at the end, you did bring it back in. You said heterogeneity imposed by disturbance. But my question is, so there, there's no change element in a study like this? No You're temporal wrong. change in this uh -huh. study. Correct. Right. Now, now interestingly, no uh, we, we actually, I forget what year it was, we did this now for, in the parallel transects. I think two years earlier, we did the same study, but only in the um, uh, mixed forest transect. We also got a Clemensian distribution. So yes, the answer to your question is we didn't do the temporal dynamic. And we didn't measure disturbance per se. It was sort of despite the history of disturbance, we got the distinctiveness. But at least in the mixed forest transect, the Clemensian structure persisted over, over time. And of course, the, the advantage of a long-term ecological site is that we can actually measure this over time, and we can see if Meta-community structures change with global climate change. Do the boundaries shift up and down the mountain with global climate change? And so we can begin to ask the question is, how dynamic is the structure? And if the structure is dynamic, what aspects of that structure change over time? And if we didn't have these kinds of sites and data, we could never address that kind of question. So again, I, and I also didn't mean to imply that all everyone's research in the Lakeo experimental course always does all of the things with that overarching diagram. But it fits into some place into that time. Thank you. Bye.